Good afternoon, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this lunchtime webinar, uh, whether you're watching us on Zoom or on YouTube Live. Um, this is the second presentation of a new lecture series brought to you by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the IIEA, entitled Environmental Resilience. Throughout the course of this series, uh, international experts will address topics such as the circular economy, air quality, environmental governance, the bioeconomy, sustainable waste management, uh, water quality, and climate change. And on behalf of the IIEA, I would like to warmly thank the EPA for their sponsorship of this series and, of course, also their collaboration with us in presenting it uh, to you. We're delighted to be joined uh, today by Monsieur Loïc Fauchin, uh, President of the World Water Council. And I'd like to thank him for his generosity in making the time to speak uh, to us this afternoon. Loïc Fauchon was, uh, has served as president of the World Water Council since 2018. He has more than 25 years of experience in the field uh, of international advocacy for global water security and access to clean water. From 1991 to 2019, Monsieur Fauchon was CEO of the water supply company of Marseille, leading a group of some 15 companies uh, in that city. He also has extensive experience in the public sector, where he worked as a civil servant and subsequently served as mayor of the French town Trette from 1989 to 1997. He's a member of the UN High Level Panel on Water Related Disasters, um, and he uh, founded himself founded the disaster relief NGO Trans Sahara, as well as Water Help which is an official uh, humanitarian response program. In 2003, he was awarded the rank of Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor. So the title of the address uh, this afternoon is The Future of Water, Opportunity and Risk. Uh, Loïc will speak to us for roughly 20 minutes, after which we will uh, go to the Q&A session with you, our audience. You can join that discussion and ask your question uh, by using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should be able to see on your screen. Feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And in fact, I would strongly encourage you to put together your question um, when it does occur, rather than waiting until the Q&A session is about to start or even uh, doing so during the session. You're free to do that as well, of course, but it's good if um, you can get those questions into us as soon as possible so that we're well organized and we can run the Q&A session uh, smoothly. And I would respectfully ask that in line with our convention here that you would ask uh, that you would identify yourself and your affiliation, organizational affiliation, if you have one, uh, when you are asking the question. So just a reminder that both the presentation today and the Q&A session are on the record. Um, so uh, feel free also to join in the discussion using Twitter if you'd like to do that, and you can use hashtag EPA underscore IIEA if you'd like to participate in that way. That's hashtag EPA underscore IIEA. So before we uh, turn to our speaker, it's my great pleasure to uh, hand over uh, for her remarks uh, to Laura Burke, who, as you know, is the Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency, and Laura will address you uh, briefly before introducing our guest speaker. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much, Alex, and delighted to be here today and delighted to um, be, I suppose, working with the IIEA on this lecture series. Um, really are delighted to have such a partnership and to have such engagement uh, and the opportunity to have these types of speakers as Luik uh, coming to address us all. Um, as Alex has said, this is the second lecture series in the, in the lecture in the series. Um, and it's great to see over 600 people uh, signing up uh, to hear more about the World Water Council and, and areas such as international hydro diplomacy, water strategies and, and the part they play in addressing environmental climate and of course social transformations and also around water security. So I think it's going to be a really interesting lecture. 
But before we get into Loic's uh, presentation, just a little bit about water in Ireland. Um, and I'm sure all of you are aware that water is hugely a hugely important national resource, uh, provides a multitude of benefits to the people of Ireland. Uh, clean, healthy water is essential to our economy. I suppose we're all conscious of areas such as agriculture and tourism. Uh, but also things like the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, uh, the manufacture of computer chips, all rely on a good supply of clean water. Of course, our rivers, lakes, estuaries and coastal waters are home to thousands of plants and animal species, from tiny insects to birds to mammals, you know, everything from kingfishers to waters, um, are th the waters are home to them. And of course, clean water is essential to our health and well-being providing raw water for drinking, but also the location for recreational activities, swimming, angling, or a walk in the beautiful blue spaces, the rivers, the beaches that we have across Ireland. And I suppose now it's more important than ever, and I think we recognize more than ever the link between health and the environment. Um, and we are appreciating probably our, our local environment more than ever before. So maintaining our waters in a healthy condition is critical if we're to maintain a vibrant and healthy society and an aquatic environment that will support a rich diversity of species and habitats. However, um, and there is a however here, uh, recent EPA assessments have shown that Ireland's water quality needs to be better protected. Uh, just over half of Irish surface waters are in satisfactory condition, which means that half aren't. Nutrient concentrations in waters are too high and the trends are going in the wrong direction. And in addition, what we've seen is a significant decline in our high status river bodies in recent years. The main activities affecting water quality are agriculture, physical alterations to water bodies and discharges from wastewater treatment plants. So protecting and improving water quality will require urgent and effective actions across all sectors. But measures to improve water quality can also bring win-wins or multiple benefits in areas such as climate, biodiversity and health. So there are huge opportunities in addressing water quality issues. The, the challenges then of managing and protecting our water resources is often complicated by climate change with the impacts of climate change often apparent through water. Too much in the wrong place during floods, too little during periods of drought. And Ireland, of course, has experienced several extreme weather events in recent years, including flooding and droughts. And by mid-century, there are predicted to be increases in extreme weather events. The impact of the drought in 2018, which I'm sure we all remember, but the, it impacted on river flows and lake water levels and was severe and highlighted the vulnerability of certain water supplies in Ireland. So that vulnerability may be mag magnified by the impacts of climate change. And ultimately it highlights the need for robust water supply and water resource management to ensure a safe and secure water supply into the future. So where all this leads me then is that I'm really interested in hearing Loic's thoughts on his experiences and experiences in other countries. And all of this can help us in our thinking in protecting our waters as a key strategic asset for the country. So with that, I'm gonna sit back and relax and listen uh, to hear all of Loic's views and thoughts. And uh, can I hand over to you now Loic? Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you know, my name is Louis Fauchon. I'm the president of the World Water Council. Very uh, delighted and honored uh, to uh, be uh, with you this uh, afternoon. Uh, I would like to take just two minutes to present to you the, the World Water Council, um, which is an uh, international uh, multi-stakeholder organization uh, created 25 years ago in 1996. And the primary mission of uh, the World Water Council is to make water uh, the driving force of uh, policy making 
because, and I will insist, uh, because water is politics. Uh, as I just say, uh, delivering response through uh, all levels of governance uh, is central to our work. And the World uh, Water Council uh, uh, focuses as a scope uh, of its activities uh, around uh, three actions. The first by uh, mobilizing political action uh, and the second by tackling uh, emerging challenges uh, and the third by co-organizing uh, the World Water Forum. As you can see uh, on the map, um, the Council is uh, the founder and co-organizer of the World Water Forum and uh, you can see where the the forum have previously, uh, this one, yes, uh, has previously uh, been organized. Uh, for, for example, um, the, the Hays uh, World Water Forum uh, was in Brazil, in Brasilia, uh, in 2018. Uh, it, it recorded uh, more than uh, uh, 100,000 participants uh, and uh, uh, 10,000 uh, delegates uh, during the official sessions. 172 uh, countries were represented, uh, 12 head of states, uh, 56 ministers, uh, and uh, more than 300 parliamentarians and, and mayors. The next one, the next one uh, will take place uh, in Dakar, uh, Senegal, in March 2022 in one year. And uh, with our uh, Senegalese colleagues, Senegalese friends, uh, we have decided to, to make this uh, forum the forum of responses uh, in order to be strongly concrete uh, to present uh, solutions uh, which could be uh, worldwide implemented. Um, that's, uh, it will be the first uh, uh, sub uh, forum held in Sub-Saharan Africa. Main theme, main theme is water security for peace and development. And uh, we, we will have four priorities, water security, um, cooperation, uh, rural development, and uh, innovation, uh, governance, uh, and, uh, and financing. That's a very, very uh, short presentation uh, of uh, our council and of, four, and of the, its 400 uh, organization coming from uh, uh, 70 uh, uh, countries. So, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, uh, first allow me to call you dear friends of water, as you do us the honor uh, of participating in this uh, conference uh, on, uh, on water. Um, let, let me... Uh, Excuse me, I have just a, a problem with my uh, uh, paper. Um, so, uh, why are we uh, talking about the future of water? And probably because uh, we are worried about this future. And uh, why are we worried? Uh, probably because we, we consider, we feel, even if some of you are not uh, water experts, we feel confused that water is in danger. And if water is in danger, then man and nature are also in danger. Why is this? Because today's world is experiencing crisis after crisis. And uh, these uh, crises are creating very strong tension uh, all around our planet. There are so many political crises, military tensions, nuclear alliance, and diplomatic tensions, but we are also experiencing food and health crises, as well as great demographic tension within the framework of uh, climate transition. And these crises are causing environmental degradation and economic difficulties. So here is the full picture. And of course, energy and water have become a scarce resource 
both in quantity and in quality in only a few decades, uh, causing uh, great concern and tensions. These tensions may be internal to a country, as you know, in California, or they may concern an entire transboundary river basin, such as the Tigris and the Frats, uh, or the, the Mekong River, uh, or the why are these such difficulties in securing the future of water on our planet? Because today's, today's demography is soaring. Billions of people, children, women, men, depend on water resources for their lives. And any suffering inflicted on water as well as on nature is suffering for humanity. And the role of our World Water Council is to make water thinking progress. First, by detecting the current and future risks, and then by explaining the present opportunities and tomorrow challenges for the generations to come. We are constantly working with our 400 member organizations on the pair priority and solutions. And I would like to thank them for their uh, efficient contributions. To live in a fairer world, which is uh, sustainable in the long term, we need two elements. First, give access to development opportunities. And second, protect nature. To do that, we need to act with a mutual respect and find a sustainable balance between the use of our coveted natural resources and a duty uh, to protect them. And water, along with her, is the first resource to be secured. Our lives depend on the availability of water, both in terms of quantity and quality. And if we fail to manage its, its availability, we condemn entire populations to being excluded from sustainable development and equitable enjoyment of fundamental human rights. Today, and also tomorrow, we must ensure water security worldwide. But also at a local scale, water security for us all and by us all. Very concretely, water security needs to combine technological solutions and political will. We can translate this as a strengthening of the three pillars on which the universal water house is built. These three pillars are knowledge, finance, and governance. First, knowledge, which means sharing innovation. Water security must benefit from technical and digital uh, uh, developments. Today, for example, desalination of seawater using reverse osmosing is implemented in more than 70 countries around the world at an acceptable cost. The reuse of wastewater is also a major step forward, <coughs> which will uh, gradually become widespread. In Singapore, for example, for more than 10 years, river water has been mixed with water from wastewater treatment plants, and it works. In Tunisia and Morocco, golf courses, gardens, parks, and soon farming fields are using wastewater effluents. In Europe, there are still uh, regulatory uh, obstacles. But in cases of water deficit, this solution will be considered good for agriculture as it is now in industry. In the same way, digitalization is gradually enabling farmers and citizens to, to monitor their consumption on a daily basis and to detect any leaks in their private networks. The second pillar is finance which enables development. 
situation can be summed up as a water is short of money, but money is short of water. And the main issue is about uh, the generalization of sub-sovereignty allowing a city uh, in a developing country, for example, to borrow without a state guarantee, while at the same time proving its ability to repay. Another difficulty lies in the weak capacity of some of the poorest countries and communities to establish projects that meet the, the bureaucratic requirements of funders. In northern countries, in Italy as in Ireland, the issue of balancing water and sanitation budgets is addressed through pricing. Free water has become very rare and has given way to social pricing. In France, we say that water pays for water, which means that the income from users and from subsidies must pay for all the expenses of the service, both for investment and maintenance. Water consumption uh, can be paid directly through metering or through a, a water subscription based fee or, or based on the uh, uh, household, which I understand will be the case uh, in Highland. This brings us to the third pillar, which is uh, that of governance, which must guarantee equitable sharing and total transparency. Dear friends of water, the time of water centralism is over. Water governance must be effectively shared between the state which guarantees the resource and controls its proper use. Then comes the role of river basins, which organize the sharing of resources and between users, guaranteeing quality through public policies. Countries such as Mexico, Senegal, Brazil, and many others have made a huge progress in water uh, security, thanks to basin management. And finally, there's a level of local authorities and citizens who ensure treatment and distribution as well as cost recovery. You can see step by step, this three level government is proving its value, provided that the citizen is involved. Actors in the use of water, agriculture, industry and domestic consumers will fight against all forms of waste. Consumers who have also citizens and voters are aware of their responsibilities. A new element has emerged in public debate, debate over the last 20 years, namely the need for water for nature and not just for mankind. Today, we understand that we also need water for nature. Why? Because nature is the best way to protect water. Nature preserves water. Nature filters water. Nature maintains the quality and quantity of water. So we must understand the need to share between human beings, but also between human beings and nature. There's also a specific question upon which I insist, which is a sensitive question water reserves or water storage systems. Today on every continent and in nearly every country, there are places where humans and nature lack water at some point in time. Scarcity today, as we just said, is a problem in Africa, but also in the US, in India, in Australia, and even in France. We don't have we don't always have water from winter, which can be used during the summertime, or from one year to the next one. We must rethink the concept of dams and reservoirs. Ecologists criticize dams, which are too powerful, too violent, move populations and assault nature. They are right, but we need dams or the wise men are thirsty and nature as well. We think, and I have been advocating for this for several years, that there is a need 
to evolve from the concept of dams to the concept of aquatic biodiversity reserves, which are above all a means to protect biodiversity. This concept is new and it is still being criticized. But we have an example of this not far from Marseille, a water reservoir, which is also an aquatic biodiversity reserve that protects the fauna and flora, but also in the same time provides fresh water to the inhabitants of Marseille. It's a sort of continuation of the concept, water for humans, water for nature. Humans are mostly concentrated within cities and nature in rural areas. We must stop opposing cities to the countryside. Urban dwellers versus rural dwellers. For years, when it comes to innovation, we have only talked about smart cities, but never about smart rural areas. Ladies and gentlemen, who guarantees water protection? Who guarantees water production? Who protects forests and the countryside? Not city dwellers, but people from rural areas. Who produces food? The farmers, not people from the cities. Therefore, we must voluntarily, but progressively shift towards adopting farming methods that are, that are acceptable to humankind. But at the same time, we must make sure that humankind is not deprived of the water and food we need in order to survive. More generally, we want everyone in the world to have access to basic services, which are water, electricity, food, health, and education, at the very least. We cannot continue to separate these basic service, services from one another. Until now, we have had Integrated Water Resources Management, IWRM, which is a vertical approach. Water for water, only water. For years, our council has advocated for a horizontal approach also, heading to the vertical one, the Five Fingers Alliance. Why? Because we must consider solutions for water at the same time as we consider solutions for electricity. And what is the use of feeding people if they die because of health issues? All of this is the same thing. Water for human development, water for humanity, so that not only we solve water problems, but also address basic services. This is why we must give more responsibilities and power to mayors, local communities, local groups, citizens, because local authority handles things better than the central government. We need this shared approach in the poorest countries. You can't open a school if there is no electricity, no water, no medical center, or if you don't feed the children. We need this horizontal and fundamental <coughs> approach, adding the vertical one. And in the coming years, we'll probably see it become mainstream in water thinking. Just a few words concerning transboundary basins, which are today the heart of a new geopolitical order. 40 to 50 persons of the world's population uh, live across 250 transboundary river uh, basins flowing across several countries. Successful examples of basin governments exist, such as uh, the Senegal River, the Rhine River, and the Parana River in South America, established through treaties and operated dedicated organizations where dialogue and sharing are the rule. There are other more complex examples where tensions continue due to strong political sensitives and permanent media pressure. This is a case of the Nile River, where the construction of the Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia has triggered a major conflict with downstream states such as uh, Sudan and especially Egypt. 
but there are no reasons today, uh, ladies and gentlemen, of speaking about what it was. The dialogue, the full dialogue, and nothing else dialogue is the only recommendation issued by our council to deal with this type of uh, situation. And finally, I, I would like to end this overview of the future of water with an essential subject, a sensitive subject, an ethical subject, but also an economic and social and therefore political subject. This subject is that of the right to water. I mean right to water and sanitation. The right to water so easily proclaimed, but so difficult to enforce and concretely implement. The right to water is first and foremost the possibility for those who are deprived of it to have access to water in quality, in quantity, at a price acceptable to all. It's a right insufficiently guaranteed by the UN system, which has never been able to impose this obligation on states. Do you know that only about 50 states have really included the right to water in their constitutions or founding texts? An international campaign must uh, once again be led by our World Water Council to convince uh, heads of states and parliamentarians to join us. The other dimension of the right to water is local. It is the ability to prohibit water cuts for the poorest and to set up minimum water and electricity allowances for very poor families to ensure respect and dignity for all. There's no, there's no technical difficulty in it, but here again, it's a decision that must be taken by the political authority. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of water, this is all through the risks to water, we can take the opportunities to put an end to water suffering. Our role at the Council is first to gather all of those who think about the future of water, to synthesize their thoughts and to continue thinking. Famous uh, European politicians said, to govern is to anticipate. We must look ahead. Our role my role is to guess all things will evolve. I've been talking for the past 20 years about water for men and water for nature. We were talking about hydro diplomacy in 1998. Today, we insist on the role of parliamentarians and the dangers that lie in opposing rural and city inhabitants. Because we listen to our water community we listen to our 400 members organization to understand all things are moving and evolving. We talk about all dams must evolve because we are aware that we must move beyond the idea of hard and vertical dams and communicate with the population. Together with the huge support of decisions maker, we try to make uh, progress on the water thinking and at the same time be able to propose and share concrete responses. Water thinking evolves every day. 20 years ago, water thinking was done by and for engineers only. It was a technical and scientific approach. Today, who participates in water thinking? Engineers, but also soci sociologists, demographers, political decisioners, scientists, etc. Everyone is called upon to think about the future of water and uh, help us to consider the ideas and deliver the responses. Dear friends of water, uh, if you should remember only one thing from this presentation, it could be water is a political issue to which every citizen has a duty to contribute. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Loic, and I'll just give you an opportunity to um, to gather your thoughts and to um, come down from the rostrum and uh, be seated. And thank you so much for that uh, terrific um, excursion uh, through the topic. 
And I think where you finished, where you started and where you finished, I think your opening phrase or one of your opening phrases was water is politics. And you reinforced that point in your conclusion by saying it's not so long ago that it was just a technical subject, you know, for scientists, for engineers. Now it's for all of humanity to debate and to deliberate on these questions and to have good public policy to begin to uh, address the uh, huge questions and indeed crises that we have in, in, in different parts of the world. So we have a, a number of questions coming in, uh, quite a few questions coming in. Um, I'm in the happy position because I'm in the chair, so I just have to read them and put them to you. I have plenty of questions of my own that I'd like to ask, but I won't um, abuse my position and I'll give way to all of our uh, guests, all of our attendees here who have been so uh, good to uh, to offer their questions. Um, just to remind people again, we are on Twitter, so you can tweet if you like, hashtag EPA underscore IIEA. We have a huge uh, attendance this afternoon, which I'm delighted uh, to, to report. Many hundreds of people uh, watching in on this uh, webinar uh, through Zoom and uh, live on YouTube. The first question I'm going to put to you um, is an interesting one, a topical one in Ireland. What are your thoughts on the sustainability of large scale water diversion projects? Uh, there's been one proposed in Ireland to divert uh, flows from the River Shannon in the west of Ireland to supply Dublin in the east. I want to ask you to address the specifics of the Irish question, but just generally on the sustainability of large scale water diversion projects. Uh, do you want to uh, answer question by question or do yeah, I take Yeah, I think it's probably, e it's probably easier. Yeah, it's probably easier. We might okay. group some of them later on, but for the moment. Okay, uh, I am more a specialist of uh, Irish whiskey than uh, Irish water, but um, and uh, concerning diversion all over the world, all over the world, it's now a, a very important issue, sometimes sensitive, uh, due to the difficulties uh, to uh, uh, operate uh, this diversion. Uh, concerning Highland, uh, for us and for a lot of people uh, 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 all over the world, I was discussing with my bureau members. It's difficult to understand that you have difficulties concerning water, because for us, Ireland, uh, uh, there's a lot of rain. You have a very good mineral water, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, difficult to understand your, your difficulties. But um, now, um, it's usual uh, to see uh, in a lot of countries uh, important diversion through canals uh, underground or in surface. Uh, look at what have done the Chinese uh, a few years ago. Uh, quite 7,000 kilometers of canal uh, in quite seven years. Uh, but you have other examples. Uh, in uh, I was uh, mentioning Senegal. Um, it could be a pipe, it could be a, a, a canal, but uh, it's very important for water security. If you are not able to guarantee security through pumping uh, more and more, through diversion, through desalination, through reused water, you need to have the quantity uh, which uh, take in account uh, the increasing of population and the increasing of consumption. Because we are not at the time except in some countries, I was mentioning Singapore, but it's a small country, uh, we uh, are not ready to decrease our conception citizen by citizen. It begins, but uh, it uh, will take, except in Israel, or, or they are very, very uh, uh, in advance uh, concerning this question. But during the next years, uh, we will decrease quite every world. Uh, you cannot explain uh, to uh, uh, a school, to a ch to children, that in the US, they have in California, 
just a few years ago. They had 700 liters per day per person as conception. And in uh, Ireland, I don't know, but in France it's 200 liters per day, a little bit less. And uh, a Palestinian or a, a, a Malian one, they have 20 to 30 liters per day. This shows uh, not only the, the, the question of diversion, but the question of securing water to have enough water in quantity, quality is an other issue, uh, to have enough, enough water in quantity uh, to save uh, the increasing of population and the need uh, of uh, increasing uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, niveau de vie, the, the level of life uh, of the population. Okay. Thank you. I should have mentioned that question came from Owen Hurst to, of MKO Ireland. Owen is a planning and development consultant here. Uh, another question I have from Sulagna Maitra, and uh, who thanks you for your insightful lecture, um, and is from the UCD Centre for Humanitarian Action. Do you have some recommendations for generating political will for cooperation? considering that water is a hugely emotive issue and mostly leads to maximalist claims from stakeholders. So what recommendations do you have from your experience for generating political will for cooperation? <laughs> How many time do I have to answer this question? <laughs> it's a big uh, one. You, you know, uh, at the very beginning of the council, when I was, I, I'm not an engineer, as you know, uh, I'm coming for the, the political and economical side. And when I was saying to my colleagues, uh, water is politics, they were looking at me as if I was crazy. It has changed now, it has changed. And uh, water has become a, really a political issue. But, uh, what can we do? There's a global level. Uh, for the first time, uh, SDGs uh, are including uh, uh, water issues and a, a access to water target. That's fine, but it does not uh, give uh, any concrete response. I've been a mayor in my life and uh, at the ground, uh, I, I was saying uh, uh, a few years ago, uh, taps before guns. It means that the environmental budgets, the water budget, have to be increased and others have to be decreased. Uh, have you heard what I have said concerning the, uh, uh, the five priorities, uh, five fingers alliance? That's the priority for the future. That's not uh, the uh, army budgets, that's not the nuclear budget. Mm. That's a problem of choice. And if you are thinking that water is politics, you need to have to give priorities in mostly two things, laws and budgets. That's the reason you need to have a, an efficient link between parliamentarians, based in organization and local authorities. I, I cannot say more than every citizen has to say to the politicians, water, water, water. Hmm. Okay, and in fact, Alan Walsh, we also had a question from Alan Walsh. Thank you, Alan, for your question. Very similar to the one that um, we've just been I'm addressing. Jennifer, Jennifer Lynch is a master's student in the University of Limerick. And she asks a question um, which I think will certainly occur to a lot of people in Ireland because we've, water has been a controversial issue in Ireland politically also for, for other reasons, for reasons to do with pricing and user charges. But Jennifer Lynch says, she, I see that water has entered the stock market and she's concerned that you know, there's a danger that water would become fully privatized. So do you have thoughts on the balance between public sector and private sector? 
in the water uh, debate and the whole water question. And you have worked in private sector and public sector. What's the balance? I mean, you mentioned earlier the question of investment and investment is about risk. Should that risk be a state risk fully? Should, it, should the private sector be involved? What's the, I mean, it's a big question. It's hard to answer in a couple of minutes, but do you have a few sentences on what you think is the right balance between the state investment, the state responsibility, and then the private uh, uh, involvement? Good question and sensitive issue. Um, you know, I've been uh, 20 years as a public servant and 20 years in a, in a private uh, company. Water has not to be privatized, never. And it has never been privatized. You have two exceptions, which have been disasters in England and the Margaret Thatcher government and in China. Privatization means to provide, to privatize the property of networks, plants, etc. It has to stay public, always. Concerning the management, the maintenance, it could be done by public or private. There's no bad public or good private. There's only good management, which could be coming for public or private. But with uh, two main conditions, the price of water has to be decided every year or every few years by the public organization in charge. Most of the time, the city's council, metropolitan councils, most of the time, sometimes the state, the government. That's the first condition. And the second is concerning the investments. Investments have also to be decided by the public authority decided. If there is an agreement between uh, the public government, the local authority government, and a private company to take in charge some investments, it's a political responsibility to the public authority. But again, water is a public good. Water has not to be privatized. You can privatize management, maintenance, as you are doing for solid waste, as you are doing sometimes for energy. But the decisions, the political decisions, has to be kept by the local authority or by the government. Thank you very much. Um, Paolo Sals has a question. In your opinion, how can or how are how is the pandemic influencing effective measures to assure water security? So do you think that the pandemic is having an influence um, on your work and on the objective to assure water security for all? I uh, may first uh, uh, shake a hand virtually uh, to my friend Paulo Sales. Uh, he's a member of the World Water Council uh, from Brazil. Um, we are in a very specific moment of the history of humanity. Um, first of all, uh, we have looked at the very beginning until now that water is uh, one of the first barrier. Water and soup uh, to have uh, clean hands, clean faces, clean bodies which is the first barrier, uh, which is also uh, affordable uh, for uh, the uh, poorest people. That's the reason that uh, the World Water Council uh, has sent uh, uh, 80,000 uh, uh, so pieces at the very beginning to our friends of uh, Senegal. So uh, that's the first issue. Water is very important as an hygienic and as a health uh, a tool 
uh, and uh, uh, capacity uh, to give uh, a good health for people. Not only. Uh, we are working in the Council uh, under the authority of uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Ahmed Sachi from Turkey, uh, concerning uh, the uh, uh, capacity to detect the COVID-19 uh, in the uh, sewage uh, uh, networks. It's a very, very, uh, what can I say? Uh, I, I, I talk it prudently, but uh, it shows that in the future, we will be able to have a, a sort of uh, an alert because you know that uh, this uh, pandemic situation in the sewage uh, networks uh, arrives seven, eight, ten days uh, before uh, that it uh, arrives uh, mm -hmm. in uh, our uh, bodies for the persons. Uh, for the rest, um, we, we, it's too short uh, to understand if uh, this COVID, uh, the pandemic situations globally, uh, will change uh, uh, our way of lives and will have uh, consequences uh, on the water management. I'm not so sure, but uh, next year and the year after, uh, we will be very attentive uh, uh, to uh, the consequences uh, of uh, the pandemic. It's a, a little, uh, it's, it's not time to, to consider this issue. We do not have any uh, um, distance, distance uh, to do that. Okay, um, I'm going to take two questions together now because they are very similar. Uh, the first is from Rachel Cave, who says, many citizens of nations which have plenty of water, like Ireland, refuse to pay anything for it. And she means user charges. There are no household charges in Ireland for water. So Rachel says, many citizens refuse to pay anything for it, yet at the same time, pollute water at every opportunity thoughtlessly and deliberately. How do we foster the required level of understanding of how precious water is without making people pay uh, through the nose for it, she says. And the similar question, it's on the same theme, and you'll appreciate it's something that has been controversial in Ireland, the question of charges. Laura Lahif, Irish people unfortunately take water for granted, said Laura. How do you think we should start changing mindsets at local level to understand the importance of water security? And Laura is a postgraduate student in sustainability in the University of Limerick. So there are two similar That's questions. Similar, but a little bit different. Mm. Um, in uh, in uh, some Arabic countries, they say, uh, God give us water but God uh, it doesn't pay uh, the networks, it doesn't pay, uh, pay the treatment plants, uh, uh, we have to pay it. Do you imagine that you will not pay uh, for your mobile phone, that you will not pay your electricity? That's the reason uh, during my presentation, I say we are quite everywhere coming from uh, a, a no price for water to a social price. What do we want? Do you think somebody who has a, a, a huge house, a huge home with a swimming pool, with gardens, he has not to pay water? But I think that poorest people, they, they could have the possibility to be free of charge concerning water. This is the political decision again. Social price is the responsibility of uh, the political authority, local or national. That's the reason also uh, for a long time when I was mayor, I have said that uh, we need to be in the situation to avoid to cut water at the tap for the poorest population. And this is not a technical issue. It's very easy to solve it for water and for electricity. 
we can get guarantee a, a, a specific amount of water and electricity uh, to have uh, the minimum of dignity. <clears throat> Concerning the second part of the question, um, it's a very different situation uh, in different countries. And it, it, will, it will take time to uh, let population understand that water uh, needs effort, uh, that water has a price, and it will come from education. You can have sometimes uh, campaigns uh, that's useful, but at school, at home, children have to learn step by step that some natural resources have to be protected, sometimes to be paid, but to be protected. That's the reason that in some countries you, you are, when there is education concerning water, you can see the consumption decreasing and it will move forward in that direction during uh, the future. So education, education, education. Um, thank you. Um, a question from Moez Aloui, uh, who's in Tunisia. Um, and um, the question is as follows. I appreciate very much the horizontal vision uh, being described by Monsieur Fauchon. But my impression is that sanitation is somehow not taking an important place in this vision, as well as the right to sanitation as an autonomous human right uh, since the General Assembly Resolution of 2015. Sanitation, uh, in the opinion of our uh, questioner, has to be a priority as access to basic services is very low compared to water and considering the health risks uh, related to the lack of sanitation. So it's focus on sanitation. I think you have made the, the answer, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, sanitation uh, uh, is uh, uh, too often left behind. Why? Because in uh, developing countries, in the poorest countries, um, the decision makers they are their priority is to bring water and electricity and sometimes mobile phones uh, to the population and they forget to bring sanitation sanitation is one of uh, the most important element of dignity human dignity sanitation is a human right has water has energy so what can we do uh, also, uh, sanitation has to pay sanitation. Uh, you cannot be true with the population if you are a decision maker, a political one, saying that uh, it will be free, free of charge. Sanitation costs more than water most of the time. And uh, it will cost more. But it's a, a total obligation. If not, we are polluting the rivers, the seashore. Look at what the situation in the most important slums in Africa, in Nairobi or Nigeria. And uh, pollution is a poison. So sometimes in rural areas, you could have individual solution or semi-collective solutions, but in the main cities, in the main suburbs of the cities, uh, it moves uh, through uh, the sewage treatment plants, which have an important cost in investments and in maintenance. And it is, needs also the technicians to be able to maintain. So, we need to have, uh, it's part of the new consciousness of water to understand that sanitation is part of water, of the cycle of water. Uh, and uh, we need to have more charge to solve this problem in the future. Um, we have so many questions coming in now um, and so many very interesting um, 
people who have joined as well, everybody who joins these uh, webinars is interesting, of course, but we have some very, very interesting international uh, um, participants. Um, Mahmoud Abu Zaid, the president of the Arab Water Council is on the line, um, which is terrific. And so many other uh, participants from overseas, which is wonderful to have that kind of opportunity to, uh, for people to share their ideas and questions. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time and um, I, I see so many questions here um, in relation to Africa. Uh, Dries Diba, uh, as, water is, as water is political, how do you deal politically with the situation in Africa where water is abundant in some areas while scarce in other areas? Um, you might touch on that uh, 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 briefly, questions about climate change uh, coming in and the links that you've drawn uh, yourself. Um, uh, I just, we just don't have time really to, uh, to handle anyone. I'm just flicking back up some. David O'Connor uh, of the EPA, is it possible to effectively decommission large scale dams to restore river systems back to their original condition? Are you aware of any examples? Now it is just two o'clock, three o'clock your time. So we really have come to an end, but I'll invite you to address one or both of those questions, if you like, just in a minute or so. I'm sorry to curtail you in that way. Me, me, Mr. Chairman, first, um, I will be back next week uh, <laughs> uh, and the week after, the weeks after. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to, to hear that uh, there's a lot of questions. It shows mm. that water are very important issues and that water is politics. I would like to pay tribute uh, to Mr. Ha Mahmoud Abu Zaid because he, he, he was the first president of the World Water Council uh, and I have worked with him. He's a, a very uh, great engineer uh, and he has also been a minister and was in charge of very important investments in South of Egypt. Uh, and I, I would like to uh, salute him and tell him publicly uh, my respect and, and consideration. Thank you. That's terrific. And um, I'd like to join with you in thanking, first of all, all of the people who have joined us, um, both here in Ireland and uh, from overseas. And as you rightly say, it does show a great interest in uh, having this public discussion, uh, this very important discussion, public discussion uh, about water, which, as you rightly said, is is political, water is politics. Um, Mr. I, Mr. I, Chairman, Mr. Yes. Chairman, excuse me. Of course. Uh, uh, le let me uh, 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 tell to all participants who have who asked a question, uh, I will be at their disposal to answer personally uh, to their question. Uh, if through uh, your organization, yes. I, I could receive these questions. We can certainly arrange to do that. And that's a very generous offer. Thank you very much for that. And we'll pass on those um, questions, dozens of them actually, that we still have that we weren't able to get to. We'll pass them on to your office and we'd be delighted if you could address them and we'll get those answers to, to the people who have asked them. So thank you very much. And there's so much to uh, think about and to ponder from what you've said, both in your presentation and in the Q&A. Um, I, 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 Remember in particular, as I said, the reference to the, you know, the very much the, the, the fundamental political question that water is uh, the right to water. I think it would be fair to say that the right to water that you've emphasized so much is not a right to free water. It's a right to water. But you talk about a social price and how that gets allocated, how it gets paid for. And that's a subject that I can tell you we debated long and hard in this country at one point in recent years. And uh, it, who knows, maybe it's, a, it's an issue that will, uh, I'm quite sure, will, will be revisited again at some point in, in, in the future for all of the reasons that you've said. So it's been a most interesting presentation. I want to thank you um, so much for giving your time, also your colleagues in the organization, the World Water Council, for helping us to set up this uh, event uh, this afternoon. But in particular, to thank um, Loïc Fauchon, the uh, uh, Chief Executive Director General of the uh, um, World Water Council for a most engaging uh, presentation and for your willingness to answer all of the questions that we had time to put to you. And thank you all to the attendees also for your participation and for your enthusiasm for this session. Thank you all very much. Thank you and take care.